Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name's uh, Paul Clark. Um, I was on this, this dais yesterday talking about hypochlorous acid. Today, I'm uh, here as a fellow of Staffordshire University Forensics Department, and I'm really privileged today to be joined by Dr. Sarah Fieldhouse. Um, Sarah is the Associate Professor of Forensic Science at the university. Um, Sarah is one of the world's leading experts in regards to forensic science, especially in, uh, in regards to fingerprinting, uh, and has a specialist interest in uh, uh, how we can look at uh, forensic science uh, and look at the correlation with, uh, with, with infection. And that's uh, the, 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 the presentation today is how we look at the, uh, the, the methods which are used within forensic science and how that can actually interlink into uh, our infection prevention strategies. Okay, um, before I hand over to Sarah, if I could just give a, a, a quick overview of our time scale and the work that we've actually been doing over the last uh, 12 months or so. Um, Sarah contacted me as the head of facilities um, just over 12 months ago with Betsy Cadwall of the University Health Board up in North Wales to ask whether there was any feasibility in regards to looking at how we could link forensic science with, uh, with infection prevention um, and how we could actually make the invisible visible. Um, and I got really excited about that and we, we agreed that we would then continue with a piece of work with a, uh, with a link between Staffordshire University and, uh, uh, and, and the Health Board and also um, helped along our way with Nolex and this is a Nolex conference and they were part of the, uh, the journey that we've been on. Um, so back in um, uh, this time last year, we actually agreed that we would um, uh, work in partnership. Uh, we, agreed, we agreed the aims at that point in time uh, and then we, we actually went through that design phase to actually see how we could actually put what we, we had on paper in, 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 into actual reality of actually going into clinical areas and actually undertaking the work that we, we wanted to do. Um, so, so that was done between Ju Ju July and October uh, of last year. Um, and then uh, in, in, in November, we actually started a proof of concept in regards to the piece of work that we wanted to undertake. And we actually started in the community setting, a very small proof of concept to actually see whether what we were doing would actually work and whether it was actually fit for purpose within, uh, uh, within healthcare. Um, we then went in December, we signed a memorandum of understanding uh, between staffs and the health board to actually see how we could actually take that work further into, in, in, into the new year. Uh, and the work that we actually needed to undertake to look at how we actually scale up from that original proof of concept that we actually undertook. So then January to February, we've actually kind of done further work in regards to uh, forensic science and infection prevention. Uh, and we're now in a position where we're uh, able to come to the stage and actually present the, the, the findings of, the, of, of that particular um, startup piece of work that we've undertaken. Um, so if I can, if I could hand over to Dr. Sarah, who is the expert in this area. Thank you, Sarah. Absolutely delighted to be able to come and speak to you all today. Um, you see the, the top image there. That's a photograph of me when I started out in forensic science. So I've worked in forensics for about 20 years, which you probably find hard to believe. <laughs> <laughs> so fewer lines perhaps around the eyes on that photograph. But ultimately, my career has consisted of undertaking a lot of research, particularly with police forces, um, consultancy for independent forensic providers, providing expert witness, and obviously tuition of our students at Staffordshire University, where we offer a variety of taught undergraduate, postgraduates, and PhDs um, in that area. So then to look at the image of me at Chirk Community Hospital that you can see at the bottom, and if you'd have showed me that 20 years ago, I said, how on earth did I get there? And where is that translation? But it's been a wonderful journey so far. And working with Paul and the fantastic team um, at Chirk has enabled what I hope is going to be some really impactful research. 
So we think of forensic science, and you'll have all have heard of, and you've probably all seen crime dramas and so on. So thinking about how it might translate may sound a bit odd to start with, but forensic science is all about detecting substances. So whether that may, in a forensic context, it might be paint or glass, fingerprints, body fluids, whatever it is. And some of these things you can see, and some of the things obviously you can't, um, which builds into the project that we're talking about today. So once you've detected something, you want to recover it, and you want to find out what it is. And that involves some analysis, perhaps at a crime scene, or more commonly, back in the laboratory. And that analysis can tell you uh, perhaps something about the sequence of events, who might have been there, what might have gone on. So we're thinking about this in an infection prevention. And I must say, you are the experts in this area and not me, and I absolutely respect that. But ultimately, you're wanting to take things and find out what they are and if it poses a risk um, to your patients and staff. We finish by interpreting our results and obviously presenting our findings. And for us, that can terrifyingly be in court. So the project's all about whether we're able to translate, as I say, forensic uh, techniques into infection prevention. And this is where some of the research has started. And the study that I'm going to talk you through today is one that's funded by the Healthcare Infection Society. And it represents one of what I hope is many uh, projects in this area. You may have seen uh, Copper Tree, uh, Steve's at the back, um, who's been exhibiting a torch called a sci-fi torch, cleaning inspection and forensic investigation torch. And this is used for what we call filtered light analysis or fluorescence examination. Um, and I've taken that technique, which is a very established forensic method, and compared it alongside and against ATP testing for monitoring within um, an NHS hospital, which was Chirk Community Hospital. So just in case you're wondering what filtered light analysis is and you're not sure, essentially, if you use coloured lights, um, you can sometimes enhance the visibility of a substance or material, um, and you can filter the light so in order to be able to see it. You can also initiate fluorescence of substances by shining different coloured lights at them. And typically, these are ultraviolet blue-green lights, and they can initiate fluorescence because that substance will absorb that light, and it will convert the energy and emit it at a longer wavelength, and what you see is a fluorescent material. Um, filters are used. So you tend to see people wearing goggles when they're using it. And this is to enable you to see what's fluorescing and not just the light. There's also a health and safety aspect to that. And in forensic... Um, science. This is very commonly used to detect body fluids because semen, saliva, uh, urine, etc., they can all fluoresce. There are other types of forensic evidence that it detects. So just to give you a couple of examples. So in document examination, this is very routinely applied and you can see the image on the left hand side there looks fairly routine. This is a document that contains handwritten text and you've obviously got a number on there, a, a quantity of money, and it's written in blue ink. Okay. However, using filtered light analysis, so by applying infrared light in an appropriate filter, you can see actually that different pens have been used to create that document. This is genuine casework. Um, so because of the composition of the inks, you can tell with chemically what's different between them. But the nice thing with fluorescence examination is instant results. Okay, so we're able to see that there's perhaps evidence of forgery. An alternative example here, so on, if you look at the blood spots, now this is a research example, it's not crime scene as you might expect in that sort of domino um, presentation. So when you look at blood, you see red substance, and in forensic work and your own work, that would be of significance. But when you apply a light source to it, you can see that there's fluorescent material there. Now, I know that there's semen deposited underneath blood, okay? but you wouldn't be able to see that if you didn't use a light source and initiate fluorescence of that sample. 
So to a forensic scientist, to say, actually, that's really important because I might have mixed DNA profiles there. I've got different body fluids. It might help me to understand a sequence of events. So they are just some general examples of how we might use it in forensic science. So here to discuss the project that we undertook within the NHS, these were our research objectives. So first of all, we wanted to select areas that were occupied by patients and that would routinely be monitored using ATP testing. We then wanted to look at well, what's the surface area of those areas that we could actually use fluorescence examination for. And this is because not all surfaces will lend themselves to this kind of examination. Some surfaces will be fluorescent themselves. Some of them will simply absorb the light. And what you're hoping is that they reflect the light and the material on it that fluoresces, you can see very clearly. But we wanted to establish that because if all of the environment contained fluorescent surfaces, you wouldn't want to use this kind of approach. And then thirdly, we wanted to look at the relationship between the ATP test readings and uh, the fluorescence examination. So in fluorescing areas, we wanted to see, well, what's the ATP reading in those? And then what about the ATP readings in the non-fluorescing areas as well? So these were the patient-occupied areas and items that we looked at. And we've done several repeats to date, and we've still got a bit more to do. And they are obviously some are representative of surfaces that you'd find in other areas of the hospital as well. So you're going to see a time lapse now of the work that we're undertaking. And this is us assessing the surface suitability. You see the light going on there, so you get an idea of what it looks like. I think I'm sitting down in one of the shots, which looks dreadful. Um, essentially, we looked around the room to say, what actually can we see without the light source? What visible traces are there? And we sort of turned the room into a scene because we started putting markers out. And I kept referring to colleagues as the room, as a scene. Um, it's just... I suppose, my comfort zone. And then we carried out the fluorescence examination and we marked up those traces. And then ATP test leads, I think some of them are sitting in this room, would then go and do their ATP testing and record the data. And as I say, we used a sci-fi torch, which you can see um, demonstrated in the exhibition area. And Paul's got one um, on the table just there. And you can see the ATP monitoring system that we used, which was the hospital's own. So the surfaces that we deemed to be useful, or sorry, suitable for examination using that light source, you can see are coloured green. Those which were considered to be partially suitable, so they might have had a reflective element to them, and then areas like the commode, for instance, you couldn't use it really on the stainless steel, but you could on the main plastic areas of it. And then obviously those surfaces which were unsuitable, okay, for various reasons. <coughs> So actually, we were really, um, it was quite encouraging because many of the surfaces there were actually suitable for this kind of examination. And to give you some idea of what you see, so this is obviously one of the mattresses. You may be able to see from where you are, but just circle towards the top of the mattress. And these are the kinds of traces that we were able to see. And I don't think you can see some of those on that screen, but you can on my laptop. Okay, um, happy to share some. We'll be publishing the results as well. But they vary in how intense they are. They vary in the shape. So you don't know by looking at them exactly what you're looking at. Sometimes you might infer, because it might look like a dribble, for instance. Um, but there are lots of, lots of material within those hospital areas that indeed fluoresced and surfaces that were suitable. So these are images of fluorescent traces from the tabletop. Um, very concentrated in the corners as well, they appeared to be. And the toilet. This is how you can see it's turned into the scene. These are exactly the sorts of markers you would use at a crime scene. And then little tags to show where the um, fluorescent areas were. If you're wondering why there's aluminium foil over the window, it's because by darkening the environment, it enables your eyes to adjust to that dark area, enables you to see a bit more, okay? And health and safety-wise, we wanted to avoid any contact um, or anybody accidentally seeing the light. 
Okay, and just some general examples from other items specifically. So unsurprisingly around the plug, you know, you might have somebody leaning against the wall and you're starting to see traces there. Very exciting, saw so lots of fingerprints, lots of ridge detail on, on there as well, which was brilliant. This is an example of a surface that isn't suitable. So toilet roll, hand roll dispensers, the surface fluoresces and that's what you generally see with them. Um, so if you wanted to adopt this kind of process, it wouldn't, be a, wouldn't fit for everything. And here's an example of some of the ATP test data. So like I say, we ATP tested in the fluorescent areas and then in a non-fluorescing adjacent area, we took a, another ATP test. So the blue columns are the fluorescent areas and the adjacent orange are those which are the controls. And the grey line that you can see across the chart is the threshold for that um, area. So this is on a patient chair. It's a single item, and these are individual areas of fluorescence there. So it is picking up things that perhaps you, would, well, you, you couldn't see because these are latent traces. Okay. Um, sometimes, so in the second example, for instance, you're getting an ATP in your control area is um, consistent with that that you're seeing in the fluorescence. And it did vary by item. So here we look at the commode. And you can see by looking on the x-axis, there's so many sites that we found that were, was fluorescent. But actually, the ATP re test readings were really low across all of it. So being able to work out what might be useful is obviously a consideration. What I've done here is to combine the data. So I said that we've done repeats of different items and areas. And what this enables you to do is to start to see, actually, is there a trend between items? Is it, are the ATP readings generally higher for this particular item? So for the overbed table, generally, the ATP test readings were higher in the fluorescent areas than they were in the non-fluorescing areas. And you can see the spread of the data there by the box and whisker plots. Um, You can see the toilet in the top left here. So again, maybe slightly higher, although we had some, the dots that you can see above the boxes are outliers. So we had some really high um, readings. They weren't consistent, but on occasion, some of the fluorescent areas gave very high readings. Um, and you see in there that it's varying by item. And clearly this was a pilot. So in future work, we'd like to extend this and actually start looking to see whether there are trends in the location of these traces and the sort of ATP test readings that you're getting to see actually where might you target any intervention or changes to what's happening. So these are examples of fluorescent traces that exceeded the threshold level. Again, all sorts of um, fluorescent intensities, shapes and sizes. And then I'm just going to come back to one because this is a slide showing you traces that are less than the 50 relative light units. And the point to me showing you this is that you can't really tell the difference between them. Okay, so you can look at a fluorescent trace, but it doesn't mean to say that it is in excess of that ATP reading. But in many instances, it is. That's an example, so you can see where the little marker scale is. So just above that was a trace that you couldn't see without that light source. That's what it looked like on the right-hand side, and those are the respective ATP measurements. So it clearly, in some instances, detected material that would be of interest to IPC. Looking at the impact that it's had to date, so what I did here was to look at how many test sites did we actually find with fluorescence examination. And we did try and exhaust the space. I think it was quite useful, actually, that when myself and the other research staff went into the areas, we don't know what you target. I don't know what your target areas are. So we went for everything. OK? Um, so and these are the sort of numbers that we found. And then with the grey bars, you can see how many of those actually would additional sites that were detected using that technique. So it's detected a lot of additional traces. Um, my understanding in the areas that we were studying is that there would be six randomly selected from a, a, a list of um, areas that you would ATP test would be taken. 
So what you're seeing here actually is far more areas that might be of interest. Okay, so in conclusion, a significant proportion of those surfaces that we looked at were suitable, and many of these are around your patient area, so around the bed and are on air things that your patients would be touching. And so we're wanting to move the research into an acute setting. So it's quite encouraging, really, thinking actually we should be able to um, employ this technology in an acute setting. Um, it detected many traces, as I've said, and fewer sites are targeted for ATP testing. And the nice thing with the light sources, you can screen areas and your results are instant. So when you've got your ATP, understandably, you can only target so many areas. It's impractical to test the entire room. Um, but it, it, the light source um, does give you that opportunity. Um, but you do have to bear in mind the type of surface that you've got and you'd risk assess it, obviously, according to the spaces that you wanted to use it in. It detected traces that did and didn't exceed. As we know from the control areas, there were things that it didn't pick up. So what perhaps we're suggesting at this stage is maybe a combination of ATP testing and fluorescence examination um, might support um, infection prevention uh, practice moving forward. It is early stage, and obviously working with the team at Betsy Cadwallader University Health Board, um, you know, will extend that, that work. Thank you for listening to me. Um, Paul's going to give my contact details at the end of the presentation, but I would encourage anybody, if you're thinking, do you know what, I think I may be able to apply that to, to my work, okay, please do get in touch. And also consider that I'm a member of a team um, who specialise across forensic science. Think back to what I said at the start of the presentation. We're detecting and we're finding out what's actually there. So if you see translational opportunities or you just want to have that conversation, I would encourage you, please get in touch. Like I did with Paul when I felt he's going to think I'm absolutely wacky having this conversation. But look at where we are now with it. So thanks again. Have a lovely day. Where do we go from here? Um, you know, we want to continue the piece of work that we've presently started, but we want to see how we can actually kind of um, escalate that and move into from a community setting into an acute setting, and how we can actually then start to do some, some work around large-scale equipment observation, because at the moment we've only done small-scale in a side room. What we want to do is actually kind of pinpoint certain equipment within a hospital and actually go out there and do the analysis around large scale pieces. So instead of doing one piece, we want to do 100 pieces and then we can get that trend in regards to um, what we find. Yeah, and it's not just around what we find, it's actually how we can actually kind of interpret that into some form of operational um, re requirements so that we can actually undertake additional training and, and development around our cleaning processes and any work that needs to be taken to support the evidence that we find. Um, our end goal to this is really to move into kind of that Mars type environment. Yeah, we, we want to look how we can actually take the findings that we've got into artificial intelligence intelligence, how we take that into predictive analysis. And we're working with the computer science department within the university at the present moment to see how we actually scale that up and how we can make that actually work and feasible. And um, because what we do in healthcare, we're really good at collecting data, we're really good at collecting information, but a lot of that information seems to sit in silos within those independent departments. What we want to do is actually bring that, that bundle together so that we've got a full, a full view of what's going on within that real estate. And by doing that, we want to move from prevention to prediction, because wouldn't it be great if we could actually turn around and say, actually, Ward 3, you are going to have an infection. Yeah, and we know that because we've got the evidence. So that's where we want to go. Um, we were funded for for the initial uh, piece of work that we've, we've undertaken through the university. We're now going out to look at additional research, for, um, research funding for that. 
So hopefully we'll get that money and we can continue, you know, the great work that Sarah and the team and the team at Betsy Cadwalder University are, are, are undertaking at the present moment. So hopefully we can come back in 12 months' time and actually present a totally different picture for you.